We're going into a series entitled Revival Ready. Revival Ready. Who is ready to see a move of God in your life? Come on. Some of you guys were so excited about the Jaguars winning last night. Who, who can attest to that? But man, I tell you what, we need to be even more excited about the glory and the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You were jumping around last night about the Jaguars winning, but we're here to say, man, we're more excited about what God is going to do in this house in this next season. We are ready for a move of God now in our generation. I believe now is the time to get ready for preparation. This series is preparation to see the manifest presence of God be made known here in this place. There's a mandate that God has placed upon this house, I believe. You know, when you get ready, you prepare for something. There's a lot of work that goes into it. Maybe it's uh, getting ready for the first day of school for your kids. What do you do? You go shopping. You make sure they have the notebooks, the backpacks. You make sure they got everything that they need. You, 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 you pack their lunch maybe the night before. You, you get prepared uh, the night before. You put your coffee on so you make up early. You, you find the perfect spot to take that first day of school picture. You know what I'm talking about? And you're going to post it on social media. And then you're going to go back and look at it years. Man, they're so cute, you know. Like we have that with our kids. There's preparation involved for that first day of school. There's preparation involved if you're, uh, of getting ready if you're going to get married. How many know, man, planning a wedding is no joke. I didn't do much of it. My wife did the majority of it, but uh, I, I, I sensed her, uh, man, there's a lot going on. You've you got to find the right food. You've got to find the right caterer. You've got to find the right venue. you got to find a pastor. You've got to make sure that there's a wedding party and you invite the right people to be a part of the wedding party. You don't want to offend anyone else, right? You get ready for a baby being born and you have seven, seven to nine months prepared depending on when you find out and you'll decorate the room, right? You'll make sure you, you, get, you stock up on diapers and you'll prepare a bag for when it's time to, uh, to go to the hospital. You'll find the right doctor. You'll do all of this preparation and you'll get ready for this preparation for this next arrival. What I believe is that God is going to teach us during this series and this year to birth, to build, and to sustain a move of God. He is teaching us to birth, to build, and to sustain revival. How many are ready to build and to sustain a move of God in your life? How many know that revival, it starts with you personally? It starts with you personally. That's what we're talking about during this series. I believe that the Lord wants to teach us. I want to preface this series by, it's been inspired by this book, uh, Doorkeepers of Revival. So some of what you hear uh, is from that book, but uh, it articulated so well what is on my heart. I read it twice over the past six months. And I just believe that the Lord is going to teach us to be doorkeepers of revival, to, build, to birth and to build and sustain a move of God. Amen? Would you pray with me? Oh, Holy Spirit, we are just so excited, God, about what you are doing. God, we're even so excited, believe it or not, about this fast. Our flesh is not excited. I know my flesh is not excited, but my spirit is so excited, Lord. In Jesus, we know that, God, with prayer and fasting, there is breakthrough. So, Lord, as we walk into the season, Jesus, Lord, may you just do a work inside of us personally, Jesus, 
to prepare us to birth and to build and to sustain, God, what you want to do in this house, what you want to do in this nation, what you want to do in this region. We're, we're, just a, we're just a part of the bigger C church, God, of what you are stirring in this day and this hour within, uh, God, your church, the, your bride, God. And so, Lord, we want to be a part of it. Lord, I pray that this morning, God, that, Lord, you would take your Logos word and you would make it rhema. Lord, your word is a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. And God, you are leading us and you are guiding us and we thank you so much. And so Lord, this morning we say, teach us your ways for we want to know you, we want to find favor. Lord, we open our ears to hear and our heart to receive exactly, God, what you have for us. In Jesus' mighty, incredible name and everyone said this morning, amen, amen, amen. Thank you, Wes, appreciate it. Let's dive in. So we don't see the term revival uh, in scripture, but throughout scripture you can see this renewing, this reviving of the people of God. It's an awakening term. It's an awakening within our hearts to, to know and to see the presence of the Lord. Here's a definition I want to give you. Revival is very simply the sustained, manifest, or tangible presence of God. The sustained, manifest, or tangible presence of God. It would seem in this time that revival has very much become a buzzword within the church today, which is not a bad thing because I believe that the Lord has placed a desire for a move of God within his church. But I would also say this, that I don't know if we really know what it takes to see revival, to see the manifest, tangible presence of God. Because make no mistake about it, revival will cost us something. Revival has a price tag associated with it. It's part of killing our flesh and not listening to what we want and our earthly desires, even some things that are good, and God's calling us to some things that are so much better than just good. It's denying what we desire, what we want, and listening to the Spirit of God. That's why I believe that the Lord has kind of set everything up in this season. We went through the fruits of the Spirit last year because it was preparation, because we don't have love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, we're just going to have empty words. I believe that the Lord is calling us to do so much more than that. Amen? So revival will never be convenient or comfortable, church. Revival will never fit into a box. There's not a system or a structure to it. Revival requires placing a priority on what the Holy Spirit wants and needs. But with revival and a move of God, it comes with decency and in order too. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. I believe the Lord wants to release the Holy Spirit and we're going to allow him to operate the way he wants, in the way he sees fit. But at the same time, there is decency and order that comes along with it. Revival always has a price tag attached to it. But church, let me say this. We won't settle for anything less than a move of God. We must be focused, fervent, and fight for it. We must be aggressive, but at the same time, we must be reverent. We must be reverent. But one thing we can't be is we can't be neutral. One thing we cannot be, church, if we're wanting to see this move of God in our time and in our generation, is to be lukewarm Christians. We cannot remain neutral. We cannot remain just checking a checkbox off our list. We have to be Christians and people who are on fire for Jesus, who are not satisfied with where we're at, who are continually moving forward. Because we're not moving forward, what are we doing? We're dead. We're declining. We cannot be lukewarm. God is calling us to so much more. What I believe is, and what I've seen here at Journey is we've, you know, we've experienced incredible moments in his presence. 
We have. Where God is just moving and God is operating. You know, whether it's a, a freedom conference where we've had a taste of his presence, a taste of revival or a worship night that we've had or a Sunday morning where it feels like this, everything has come together or maybe in a small group setting where it just feels like, man, God is here. It's, uh, and there's no denying that the presence of God is tangible and he's evident and he's in a room and in a place. It's Genesis 28 when Jacob, he makes this statement and he says this. He says, surely the Lord is in this place. You see, revival is undeniable. A move of God, when God is in the place, everybody knows it. Everybody can sense it. Everybody knows that God is in the room. And he says this next, and I did not know it. Surely the Lord is in this place, but I did not know it. Church, the church has operated far too long not knowing God is in the room. And it's time for the church to be awakened, to be revived, to understand that Jesus, the Son of God, the presence of God is available at every single moment. To be awakened to the truth of the love of Jesus. And watch what he says next. I love this. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? The church has tried to entertain people into the kingdom of God. If you try to entertain people in the kingdom of God, you'll have to entertain them to keep them in the kingdom of God. But when you have the presence of God, people will begin to say, how awesome is this place? How incredible is this place? I love going there because I sense something different. I sense the presence of God. Is there something different about that place? I know he is there. I know God is there. The world will say as we experience this, how awesome is this place? And he writes this. It says this. It says, this is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. We have to make this journey in your heart personally, in your temple personally, and here at Journey, we have to make it the house of God fully and completely surrender to his will and his way. The house of God has gone far too long without making his presence the center of attention. You see, that's why we, uh, we have this unique characteristic here at Journey. You can find it on the website. You can find it out in the hallway. We have it written down. And we are a, unapologetically, we are a presence-driven church. You may say, Adam, what does that mean? This is how we articulate that. We are not built around a person. It's not built around me or another staff member or, or anyone else, but we're we built around. We're built around the presence of God. Well, why do we gather here? We gather here for Jesus. We gather here for him. We don't gather here for me. We don't gather here for Pastor Eric. We don't gather here for anyone else. We gather here for what? We gather here for the presence of God. Which our vision is this, is to build a community of people that's life around the presence of God. As we build a community of people that loves God, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, all your mind, and with all your strength. And as we build a community of people that loves others well, and we do that around the presence of God. What ends up happening is our mission. It just happens naturally. Our mission is to see our cities transformed by the power of the gospel for the glory of God in our generation. You see, some of you might be saying, well, Adam, that, uh, the, the vision is great and stuff, but what about the least of these? What about those, the, the orphan and the widow and, and, and those who are struggling? What, what about those people? What I would say to you is this, the text in Matthew where it says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Listen, my heart is burning to get outside of these walls and to meet the needs of others who are hurting and broken. We have to do that. But it comes from a place of just saying, Lord, I seek you first and then I'm going to be able to do the work in a way that, man, imagine what would happen in our communities if we seek the presence of God and we allow the compassions within our hearts to then transform people by meeting the physical needs of others, meeting uh, in compassionate ministries. Amen? 
Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Just imagine the impact we can make on others when we combine our hearts of compassion with the power of his presence. Because church, we will see the power of the gospel radically transform our cities. I believe it. I know it. But it starts with us chasing after his heart. So how do we build this revival culture? How do we get revival ready? You know, we all have, uh, have moments in life that just tend to mark us, right? When we have this experience with the Lord, it's like, man, my life is forever impacted and changed. And I pray maybe you're in this room and you haven't, if you haven't had a moment like that, I pray that today would be a moment like that. But I had one of these moments back about 12 years ago. My wife and I went on vacation uh, to New York City, and uh, my wife was pregnant at the time, but we were just, uh, we were just excited about uh, touring New York and looking at, it was Christmas time, so we're looking at Christmas de- decorations and just having the time of our lives. But we decided to go to a church called Times Square Church in New York City that Sunday morning while we were on vacation. And I remember as we're walking up to the building, I just begin to feel the presence of God. And I was like, okay, this, this, is, uh, this is an expectancy in my heart maybe. I began to walk into the door, and the first person that I greeted, it just felt like, man, the Lord is incredible. The Lord is here. And the, I, I promise you, I don't remember what was said. I don't remember what was spoken. I don't remember what songs they sang. I don't remember anything else. But I just remember just wanting to weep the entire time I was there. Because I knew that, that God was in the place, but why? So it was David Wilkerson's church. David Wilkerson founded a Teen Challenge, but he's known to be this man of prayer. His church was a praying church. They had prayer meetings set up at all times. They, they just went after the Lord. And so the results of that fruit of Building a literal house of prayer was when people walked up and got into the church, you literally just felt the power and the presence of God. How cool would it be? And I believe this has already happened to a level degree, but I believe it's going to happen even more. I've heard testimonies of this. Is when people pull into the parking lot, they immediately just feel the weight and the glory of God. They immediately just want to repent. They immediately just want to turn to Jesus because the Lord is in this place. It's that that same moment that Jacob had. Surely the Lord is in this place. So talking about this revival culture, we're going to be looking at different ways of building this, but the one number one and primary way that it happens is through prayer. It's going to happen when we become a people of prayer, when we make this literally a house of prayer. The phrase house of prayer is in Isaiah 56, where it's used twice. Isaiah 56, 7 says this, these foreigners I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer. For what? For all nations. (laughs) Notice that. It's not for us to keep in, but it's for what? For us to give away, for all nations. Now we see this again in Mark chapter 11 when uh, Jesus goes and he chases out the money changers of the temple. I want to read this passage in its entirety and then we're going to spend the remainder of our time here. Mark 11, 12 through 24, it says this. Now the next day when they had come out, of, come out from Bethany, he was hungry And seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see perhaps he would find something on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. In response, Jesus said to it, let no one eat from the fruit from from you ever again. And his disciples heard it. Verse 15, so they came to Jerusalem, then Jesus went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables, the money changers, and the seats of those who sold doves. 
and he would not allow anyone to carry wares through the temple. Verse 17, then he taught, saying to them, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. But you have made it a den of thieves. And the scribes and chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him. For they feared him because all the people were astonished at his teachings. When evening had come, he went out of the city. Now in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. So Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God. For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart but believes that those things he says will be done. He will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. I want to give you three things this morning from this text that, I, that, that was pointed out to me by the Holy Spirit. Number one, Number one, Jesus demanded, he demanded his house to become a house of prayer. Jesus demanded that his house become a house of prayer. Mark eleven seventeen. 17. Then he taught, saying to them, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. You see, prayer serves as the center of spiritual activity upon which everything else depends. Prayer is what makes things happen and work. Prayer has the answer and the solution because it is a direct path to God. And when we pray with the word of God, something breaks and something happens. We're going to be talking about that a little bit more next week, about spiritual authority, that as we pray prayers that are partnered with the Word of God. As we use the Word of God to pray, something breaks. And also, underneath the blood of Jesus, something changes because of the cross. And this is what God is calling us to, to make journey a literal house of prayer. So I challenge you, if God is calling us to be literally a house of prayer, we must become people of prayer in our private lives. We have a, uh, a new prayer service that's uh, being launched on Wednesday nights. And the Lord just really spoke to me three, four months ago and just said, we need more prayer opportunities. And he felt like the Lord just kind of highlighted Wednesday nights would be the night to do this. And I want to preface this before I go in and tell you about the night is small groups are still, can still meet on Wednesday nights. It's, we're not trying to, 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 to cancel those or anything like that right now, but we wanted to add something to it. So, but I felt like the Lord was just saying, as I was battling with it, keep it simple. Because I had this thing inside my heart was saying, okay, I'm, I'm going to get a, we're going to have a full band together. We're going to uh, get, a, get the, the entire, you know, sound media teams going and, and everything else. And the Lord just kind of spoke to me very clearly and said, no, just keep it simple. Keep it simple. Don't try to fill it with anything else. Just keep the simplicity of just gathering around me. So let me tell you what the night kind of was going to kind of look like on a Wednesday night. On Wednesday nights when you come in, we're just going to start off by sharing five, ten minutes on just uh, whatever the Lord puts in our hearts, whether it's uh, a hunger for him, developing an intimate relationship with him, uh, how to read the word, whatever it might be, but it's going to have to do with our personal time with the Lord. And then we're just going to go in and we're going to pray. That's it. That's what the night's going to look like. We're just going to walk around. We're going to pray. There's not going to be any fancy lights. We're just going to have the house lights on. It's just going to be the simplicity of gathering around the presence of God. The question is this, is just simply coming and gathering around the presence of God enough for the people of God? Do we have to fill space? Do we have to strive? Do we have to try to 
entertain you. No, we, what are we doing? We're coming, we're just gathering around the simplicity of just being with Jesus and praying. The night's also set aside for spiritual warfare. We're going to be praying through things that we feel like the enemy is just trying to throw at us. And we're going to be discerning and praying through so we have a preparation, a battle plan of what God wants to do here. So we're battling every attack of the enemy in that, in, in that, on that Wednesday night corporately together. It's going to be a beautiful and wonderful thing, I believe. We're also adding, uh, if you come to second service, 11 o'clock prayer meeting. Uh, 11 o'clock, you can come in the annex, and we're going to just start off prayer. We already have a 9 a.m. Uh, prayer meeting that meets before this service. We're going to add one before second service at 11 a.m. We're also, Saturday mornings, want to challenge you, especially during the fast. Come out at, we, there's a number of us that gather at 8 a.m. on Saturday mornings just to come in here and pray. We turn the fluorescent lights on, and we just walk around, we pray. I believe that the Lord literally wants to make this a house of prayer. Who is with me and excited about just making this a house of prayer? Come on. Because when the church becomes a house of prayer, the church will become unstoppable. Do you understand that? When the church becomes a house of prayer, the church will literally become unstoppable. Journey, let's be people of prayer. Because hell, it isn't nervous at our knowledge, our titles, or our talents. But it trembles, it moves out of the way, and it must obey. And when there is blood-bought believers seeking after him and her on their knees. So if I were the devil, this is what I would do. I would make every believer lazy in prayer. I would make them too busy to pray. I would make them believe that the prayer meeting is the boring meeting, that God doesn't hear nor answer my prayer. If I were the devil, I would cause churches to run to everything else except prayer and prioritize everything else except the prayer meeting. Because when the people of God pray, I'm telling you, miracles will happen. I'm telling you, the prodigal will return and come home. I'm telling you, lives will be set free when the people of God pray. There is power when we pray. Which leads me to point number two. Jesus displayed the power of prayer. Here in this text. Jesus displayed the power of prayer. In verse 13 and 14, Jesus curses this fig tree. He comes back. And the disciples, they notice this. It says this in verse 20. Now in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. See, there's power in the name of Jesus. There's power when we pray in the name of Jesus. Now, two scriptures, there's many scriptures that show the power of Jesus, the power of people who pray. But here's two that I want to read to you. Matthew 16, 19. I will give you the keys, the authority of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind, forbid, declare, to be improper and unlawful on earth will have already been bound in heaven. And whatever you loose, permit, declare, lawful on earth will have already been loosed in heaven. Ephesians 3.20 says this, Now to him who is able to carry out his purpose and to do super abundantly more than all that we dare ask or think, infinitely beyond our greatest prayers, hopes, or dreams, according to his power that is at work within us. Both of these scriptures show us that God partners with our prayers to bring about his purpose. He's asking us to partner with him to see his will be done. He's looking for people to partner with. You see, prayer is the element that unlocks dimensions of revival and sustains the revival culture. Prayer raises the spiritual standard corporately. It sets the atmosphere. It alters outcomes and moves the hand of God. Prayer must be and remain at the helm, at the center of everything that we do. There is power in prayer, church. Yes. There is power when the people of God pray. My sister, she got pregnant with her third child about eight years ago. And at the first ultrasound, as they looked at the x-rays, and they, they found this mass on the outside of her placenta. I've shared this story before. I want to share it again. It's been a number of years. 
They found this mass on the outside of the placenta that was growing. Now, the doctors told my sister, you, you've got to abort the baby. You can't carry this baby to full term. It's going to threaten your life. It's going to threaten the baby's life. And uh, it's not smart to continue this pregnancy. You've got to, you've got to abort the baby. My, and my sister said, no, I'm not aborting this baby. I'm going to carry this baby to full term. I'm going to trust God to do something. It was a really uh, crazy medical thing. They called it a partial molar pregnancy. So this mass began to grow outside the placenta and all these doctors were concerned and they were looking at it and um, this mass had grown to the size of my fist, y'all. And it was on the outside of the placenta. Now, it could have spread and uh, it could have been a tumor that created cancer, everything else. And fast forward a little bit, it got down to one week before, um, before her, her C-section. And the doctors are telling her, you know, you need to really think about making a horizontal uh, incision or a vertical incision, I'm sorry. Make a vertical incision. We gotta get in. We gotta see everything, make sure that the mass that was growing is not, is not cancerous, get the baby out, all this kind of stuff. I said, my, my sister said, no, I, I don't agree with that. I feel like the Lord is gonna heal me, make a horizontal incision. And so mind you, one week before her scheduled surgery, this mass, again, was the size of my fist. So I left Jacksonville, she lives in Atlanta, she has, 20 doctors in the room, like literally 20 doctors because this is a special study and uh, all these interns in the room and they're expecting the worst from the situation. So I'm driving here from Jacksonville up to Atlanta and, and it's early in the morning and I'm just praying and I'm believing the Lord is going to move. My sister started a blog and there's all these other churches praying, all these other people praying and people were following her story and praying, just believing that uh, my, my niece was going to be healthy. And so it came time for surgery. And uh, we're in the waiting room with, with two of my closest friends, uh, my wife and I and, the, and, and uh, my sister and my brother-in-law's closest friends and also my parents. And we're just believing and praying that the Lord is going to do something. So they get back in surgery and we get a text from my, my brother-in-law. And he texts and he says this, Put that on the screen. So still prepping uh, her surgery. I haven't uh, even gone in yet. I said, okay, we're praying. So we're all gathering around. We're praying. We're believing God's going to do something. Go to the next text. My brother texts and says, seven pounds, six ounces, and no mass at all. No mass. Literally, y'all, just think about it. That ma- I want to show you x-rays here in a moment. That mass was the size of my fist, and it was there one week beforehand. And so we're like, where did it go? What? Uh, my dad says, what? No mass at all. Uh, oh, wow. Oh, wow. Pray, and my wife says, oh, praise the Lord. Go to the next text. No mass, nothing. This is my niece. And the doctors were, call- were saying this, already being called the miracle on Peachtree Street. It's in Atlanta, on Peachtree Street, Emory Hospital. Hashtag miracle. Lars is all amazing, crying over here. Next, next text. Father, this is what my dad said. This is, this is incredible. It's amazing how when you're walking something and the Lord just kind of, uh, when you're walking with the Lord, the Lord just kind of speaks to you before it even happens. And, and my dad says this. He didn't tell us this. He says, Father told me last week he knew there was a mass, but that he was a mass murderer. <laughs> Come on, Jesus. And they're saying, we're, they're not even testing the placenta. It's just it's incredibly normal. Their doctors are saying prayer changes things. And one said, hashtag miracle. Wow, God be the glory. So the doctors were expecting the absolute worst thing to happen. But literally, our God is the same God today as he was yesterday. And he will be forever. Our God is a miracle working God. And he literally... It wasn't, like the, it wasn't like my niece was just fine or my sister was just fine and they took out the mask. No, he decided just to remove the mask altogether and astonish the doctors. And so as we're getting this report, I'm like, oh my goodness, Lord, you are so incredibly good. I want to I wanna record these conversations with these doctors. So that's exactly what I did. I got on my phone. I put my, uh, my, my, uh, I put my, my phone in my pocket and just started recording the conversation with the doctors. I want to share those with you. We play that video. My goodness. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. 
Do they have an explanation at all? I'm just a baby doctor, so I don't know. And the baby's fine, and they're telling me they couldn't find anything. So, yeah. And all the big cancer specials and all that, none of them had to, had to do it. So, yeah. <laughs> so, so when, what we're understanding, they covered up and they didn't even find the 23 inch mass that they were looking at. That's about, they couldn't find anything. They couldn't so find the anything. The only thing in the uterus was the baby and the placenta. There was, and they were expecting to find a 23 centimeter mass. Nobody's understanding what's going on. I don't even know Jesus. What the, why they Jesus. would be. But anyway, so yeah. So Miracle the baby's fine and the baby will come back up to the recovery room with, with her mother. It's just pretty right. little baby. <laughs> I need our big worries. Thank you. Thanks. It's so un unexplainable. Un it is the, the, the 23 it was huge. inch mass. Yes. Salmon mass. It's gone. Which is like this. And did they do any tissue? Uh, we, so we sent the placenta, we sent the whole placenta to pathology, even the pathologist said it looked so grossly normal that they didn't even do a frozen, they were just sending it for a permanent. So a frozen would be immediate results, right. but they didn't. They saw that as frozen. early as, as late as Friday. I understand. Did you see it too? As late as Friday? Yeah, I saw the images too. Yeah. Dr. Krishna showed me. We're all in like a <laughs> It is amazing. That's my mom. It's so amazing. Yeah. Crying. And if anybody in the room that we Our God is there. a mass murderer. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Somebody was like, maybe the baby ate it. I don't know. <laughs> no sign. No sign. No sign. No sign. No sign. No sign. No, like it's after we took the percent out, you know, we really felt Everything's like, perfectly normal. Yeah, we felt on the inside that you were really good. We even tried to look inside there. There wasn't anything outside or abdominal or anything. And um, we were all like in shock, and I'm really glad she pushed for the bikini decision. Yes. So there's no, because so she right. she all those doctors in there waiting for something we bad wait, yeah. to possibly they happen. They all just found out one by one, and while we finished, we were like, there's nothing to do. It was just a routine C-section, so it's amazing. It's a miracle on Peachtree Street. I love it. Yes. I love it. Yes. Oh. I mean, it looks like a normal placenta. I mean, you can compare it to other placentas if you do the image. Too. But y'all had pictures of placenta beforehand. Oh, that also sounded it, it wasn't like was normal at all. It's like the mass was part of the placenta. There was normal placenta on the ultrasound too. Three inches. Not and small. it was the grape clusters and everything that, that's completely. Did you see it? Yeah, the, it was yeah, she saw it. Yeah. yeah, there was no grape anything in there. God is good. <laughs> God is good. <laughs> Just the baby. <laughs> That is great. Yes. Oh. Come on. We serve a miracle working God, church. Come on, we serve a miracle working God. What I, be what I believe is that when my sister, she knew all the prayers that were going out, when my sister said, you know what, I'm not going to have a horizontal, uh, I'm not going to have a vertical cut, I'm going to have a horizontal, I believe that's when the Lord just decided, okay, I'm going to do this incredible miracle. You see, when we have faith and believe that God is going to do something, this is exactly what the Lord does. Jesus asked us that our prayers be full of faith. He asked us our prayers to be full of faith. Mark eleven twenty two 22 through 24, so Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. For surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast in the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done. He will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. A mountain here is symbolic of an obstacle in his way. And when we believe and we have faith, God can move a mountain, church. Come on, y'all. God can move a mountain when we're facing an obstacle in our life. I want to invite the band forward. We're going to go ahead and pray here in a moment. I've got more, but I feel like we need to go to the altar time right now, yeah? There are people in this room who need a miracle from God. 
who need God to intervene in a situation. And if you have faith to believe, because the power and the work of God that lives within you, we can see God move and work.